So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Up until a month ago, my colleague and still my friend, Kate Kenny. Um, she uh, works as the historian and his historic archaeologist at the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program, and uh, really has taken a great interest and uh, passion in the War of 1812. And um, her talk today is entitled The Burlington Contonement, Military Presence in Burlington, and Soldiers' Life and Death. So uh, take it away, Kate. <laughs> Wait, you gotta wait till after. <laughs> um, thank you very much, and thank everybody for coming. Um, it's it's a lot. Of, it's a big title. It's a lot of ground to cover um, in basically half an hour. Um, but what I'm going to do is going to try to give you over the next couple minutes a, just a snapshot of Burlington's role during the War of 1812, and some of the events that were happening, and some of the experiences of individuals as well. So. Um, just to get everybody oriented to what Burlington may have looked like during that time period, um, this is just sort of a slightly modified image from uh, David Blow's book. Um, basically, all the activity in Burlington really is centered on the, the main cantonment, and that's just right here. You can see it um, right on the uh, shore, on the bluff, it's about a 100-foot bluff. Um, Basically, just a few days, I guess they were just anticipating trouble, I guess, um, just a few days before the war was actually declared, um, a fellow named uh, Colonel Isaac Clark, who was just given command of the 11th uh, Infantry, a brand new regiment, um, it was going to be composed half of people from Vermont and half from New Hampshire. He was told to come up here and start the cantonment. Um, he purchased the property sort of under the table, under his own name. He would later sell it to the government. Um, after the war was declared and it was safe to do so. Um, but as soon as he uh, started collecting his recruits here, he started preparing the ground. Prior to that, everything pretty much north of Pearl Street, except for slight exceptions, was just a, still a sand plain uh, pine forest. Um, so he basically put his recruits to work, clearing the ground, and then just slowly adding buildings as it goes. Now it's interesting, we don't know exactly um, if there's a uh, formal uh, contract with, say, a civilian contractor to build these. I have run into accounts of soldiers with special skills building some of the buildings. So they were, it might be a little bit of a mix. Um, I do know that one soldier was injured uh, by a falling rock when he was uh, putting the final touches on the uh, foundation of one of the storehouses. Um, and then just to kind of give a quick tour of the cantonment, basically they had a um, uh, a guardhouse or you know, basically a place to hold um, you know, any soldiers doing anything um, uh, not, not by the book um, or any suspected civilians uh, who, who may have been either smuggling, uh, which we've covered quite a bit today, or um, maybe even spies. Um, so there's a little bit of that. Um, also, occasionally it would have uh, British prisoners of war, um, but they, they didn't really stay in Burlington too long. And the officers were actually given the opportunity to parole. And they would actually be able to find a place in town and wait until they were formally exchanged. Um, one of the hotels well known for that was actually on Colchester Avenue as you head down the hill towards the uh, Winooski Bridge. Um, there was a, a place just off on the right um, that most of the paroled British prisoners would, uh, officers would hang out. Um, then basically next to the, that would be uh, sort of the barracks for the guard at the time. Uh, next to that was a, um, a, a small officer's barracks. Um, but over time they needed more uh, space for the troops so they built a row of houses in here, um, kind of on speculation, a, a private individual. And it's kind of known as the Pell Houses. So it's pretty clear that the uh, officers had some options. Um, other officers would just get hotel rooms and stay there. Most of the commanders did, although Clark himself bought his own house and uh, eventually sold it at the end of the war. Um, next to that would be the, the largest structure, which would be the hospital. We'll get more to that later. Um, and then extending north from there were uh, the low barracks for the troops. Um, these were fairly poorly slapdash put together. Um, soldiers made a lot of complaints about it. Um, and they kind of turned the corner and then you end up with the uh, a gun shed, and then you're basically into the, the stables and storehouses. Um, and then the small one over here, if I can 
get it quite right, um, was uh, the uh, magazine for the Ford, uh, for the Contoment, I should say. Um, the actual battery is a later construction. Uh, it was built uh, with, with Murray's, just prior to Murray's raid, which we again heard about. Um, and that, they, they built it right on the crest. It's kind of interesting because it was really designed just to protect the ships that were under, under the, uh, the bluff. Um, because this is, this, this, at this point, Lake Champlain's 12 miles across and there are no cannons at that time that are gonna reach across. So it's really very specific for guarding McDonough's ships that, uh, from Murray's raid. Um, then looking at the rest of the town, now there should be three pamphlets that uh, you, you have. Um, it details a lot of the other locations in Burlington that had some connection to the War of 1812, but try not to repeat those. But um, in addition to that, you would have um, uh, military bakeries um, that you know, private individuals making contracts with. Um, the Mills Rose guys, they were the publishers of the local newspaper, but they also sold um, military books, how to, how to do drill to the officers who were just new at the job so that it could look like they knew what they were doing. Um, maps of where they might be going, um, that, that was on sale. You could get uh, new boots, uh, you could get a uniform made. I mean, so the, the town actually sort of, um, with this influx of soldiers, uh, over the course of the time, because basically Burlington's um, an active uh, military site for the entire war. There's no real break. Sometimes the, the level of troops will, will dip down to a couple hundred, but at times it would reach almost up to 4,000. So it would really overwhelm the community at times. Um, in addition to the cantonment itself, of course, with all those troops, they, this was not enough to keep everybody. Um, so they had a large campground back, you know, just basically for tents, maybe winterized huts, um, you know, for, for longer term stays. Um, back in there, you would have basically like, you know, the latrines, the places where the soldiers would be cooking. So there's a lot of activity, even beyond the cantonment. Um, in the second year of the war, the military actually buys another five acres of land up here and clears it um, for more campground space. Um, and then even later, they, because of disease, they actually set up a satellite camp, which was uh, in existence for a very short time in South Burlington, just uh, basically in the area of the airport, but not quite at the airport. Um, and that was on John Doxey's farm. Uh, later he complains quite bitterly of his missing fences. Um, but, uh, and then as you look around, there, there, there's even, every time you kind of dig in, you, you see more. Um, they actually had um, guards at the, uh, the crossings to Winooski Bridge, so that would have been sort of a checkpoint into Burlington. They had um, outposts out at Colchester Point, so it's not just Burlington, it actually really extends uh, quite far. Okay. Um, and then, just to put it into even a broader context, um, Burlington basically sits in the hub of the area of activity. Um, it had great connections with, say, Greenbush, which was another major hospital site, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which was a, a large British POW site, that's where most of the enlisted men would be sent eventually. Um, of course, it had the connections with Whitehall, which became the primary uh, 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 supply area after Burlington was sort of relieved of that job. Um, of course, its connections with Virgens, uh, basically with the shipyard and the construction of McDonough's fleet. And that's interesting because basically when uh, the, the British were coming to check out what was going down there, um, it basically, the, the regulars from Burlington would, would be at Fort Casson. Um, then the other supply line would be Wells River. There was actually a large area for uh, military butchering at Wells River. And then they would just overland the material across the state. Um, there was outpost, uh, far outpost at Swanton, the one that was burned, Derby, which was burned, fancy that. Um, there was actually a cavalry outpost in Danville. Um, so you can actually see you know, Burlington's kind of reach. It had all these uh, communications with these locations. It was also an area where they could launch, um, s you know, small attacks on either smugglers or small groups of British, you know, if you go to Caldwell's Manor. Um, it was also a, a place where uh, the troops would be just before they would go on major campaigns, such as the, you know, headed up to the Battle of La Colle or the Battle of Chateauguay. Um, it, it, it ju it's just really connected with everything that's happening in this part of what was called the Ninth Military District. Okay. Um, over the course of the war, 
Um, more than 30 different military units were here, and actually 20, more than 23 of them were regular units. Um, basically, the, the troops were drawn from mostly New England, but we, we do have some of the regiments, let's say like the 10th and the 14th, that actually have quite a number of Southerners involved. Um, it's kind of interesting to note that when you look at uh, Vermont histories, they usually uh, really play up the Plattsburgh militia guys. But Vermont actually, even though a lot of folks were a little bit Federalist leaning, they actually were um, quite uh, involved with the War of 1812. As I said, the half of the, the, the 11th Regiment was Vermont, the entire 30th, the entire 31st were Vermont, and then you have Vermonters in the 9th, the 21st, the 25th, so they are quite involved. It's not just the militia at Plattsburgh. Um, it's interesting, in those regiments, sometimes you get a couple of famous people. Um, one of the more interesting ones was William Miller, the founder of the Millerites. He was with the 30th Regiment. Um, uh, Lieutenant Farrington, who was with the Black Snake Affair, he was with the 30th Regiment. He came back as a regular. And um, in the, the Dragoons, in the regular Dragoons, uh, was the father of Benjamin Butler, noted Civil War general. So th there's actually some more connections going. Okay. Um, basically, Burlington is, is not in sort of the active combat zone, so to speak. Um, the only really time that there, there was any real fighting in the area was with, of course, Murray's Raid, which was alluded to before. It was more sort of a drive-by shooting rather than a real battle, but um, basically the British, of course, using the ships that we so kindly gave them, uh, came back to visit. <laughs> and basically, they, it was a very calm day, so they actually had the row, so like the, the, the whole element of surprise was completely shot as they work into the harbor. Um, but they, they kind of come in here and they stand off about a mile and a half off of Burlington and basically, you know, sort of eyeball the city. And what they're really trying to do is actually get information on uh, McDonough's fleet, which is actually uh, huddled up underneath the, uh, the protection of the battery, which it w was built for. Um, actually, one of the locals, Nathan B. Haswell, said that they were kind of huddled up the, under, under the, uh, the bluff like uh, chicks when the hawk flies over. Because they, they just weren't leaving, because they weren't really done yet to go out to fight the, the, the British. Um, but basically the British do kind of drift in, and finally the battery starts firing, but they, they basically start firing way too early and just keep splashing the cannonballs into the water. The British are just, again, just making notes about what ships are, are there under the, under the bluff. And eventually the Americans actually pushed two scows that had each one, one cannon on them to go and take a couple more pot shots a little bit closer. And by that time, then the British decide, heck with Burlington, let's go see what's on the rest of the lake that we can take and burn. Next. Oh, actually, could you go back? Sorry. Um, uh, the, the builder of the, the uh, battery is Sylvester Churchill. He was from Woodstock. He was 29 years old. And uh, his previous job had been basically carpentry and printing. But he did a rather good job with the battery. Um, during, the, during this engagement, of course, there are a couple of cannonballs that have been found over time in Burlington, most of them, of course, in the face of the bluff or down by um, uh, basically the dive shop. Um, you gotta imagine that basically the dive shop area and, uh, uh, and basically out towards the lake is all built land. So it wouldn't, wouldn't have been there. That would have been basically your shoreline. Um, so it's not surprising to find some cannonballs there. Now, local tradition says that uh, McDonough's headquarters at the time was um, the Samuel Hitch Hitchcock House. Um, and Judge Sam, it is a little farther up the hill, so it's kind of hard to be you know, believe, but they say that it got hit with a cannonball during the engagement. Um, there might be some truth to this, because I do know that there was a cannonball found directly opposite a six-pounder um, in 1914, out in the middle of the road. So it could have it happened. Um, OK, now. Um, Basically, of course, again, without uh, the excitement of continuous battle, um, life for the soldiers in Burlington would have been fairly quiet, um, except for maybe the mischief that they themselves got up to. Um, you know, basically it would be drill, getting used to uh, being a soldier, moving supplies. That was a big job that they did. Um, and they, they kind of racked up quite an interesting uh, repertoire of things that they would do to get in trouble in their spare time. Um, for example, they would you know, disband some orders. Uh, they would sell their own equipment to civilians. One guy had to pay back his $18 for his rifle. Um, uh, sleeping on post, which technically is a capital crime, but they didn't quite do it because 
apparently too many people were doing it. Um, drunkenness, of course. Uh, one fellow had to uh, pay someone back $3 for all the windows that he broke in the house. Um, uh, of course, theft was a very big problem. Uh, soldiers would actually just kind of wander into people's houses and just take whatever they want. Um, one of my favorites, though, is that one guy got into trouble for basically taking the officer's horses for a joyride. Um, so, so anything they could get up to, they would. Um, and of course, the, the, uh, the punishments that they came up for for the soldiers were quite diverse as well. Um, hard labor, uh, loss of whiskey, that was a big one. They liked doing that. Um, solitary confinement, um, riding the wooden horse with cannonballs tied to your legs, very uncomfortable. Um, sometimes they would just shave, shave you and brand you and send you on your way. Um, so they, they were very, very creative when they were doing this. Um, of course, the, the kind of the worst offense you could do was desertion, and these are just, just two examples of descriptions of individuals that may have hightailed it for some, one reason or another. Um, I like the second guy here. He's, he's probably sulking in, uh, sulking in Berlin. It's like, go find him. Um, and then, uh, next one. Um, and this is, of course, another one of my favorite ads. Um, some of the horses from the cantonment were stolen at some point, and uh, there's a great description of them. But I just like this one. The other one's inclined to amble. So you, you're on the lookout for an ambling mare. You know, so, so, um, but again, this was like a daily thing. You know, there were so many court martials going on in Burlington. Um, it's pretty much sometimes what the officers were doing full time. Okay. Um, these are just some of the area, places in Burlington associated with these uh, mis miscreants and misdeeds. Um, down on uh, Battery Street, you might recognize this building. It was actually the site of one of the more popular drinking houses, and quite a bit of trouble stemmed from that location. Um, and then this block on Church Street was the location of the civilian um, jail. And it was quite a debate who had the, the authority to uh, uh, keep the soldiers in line. And uh, at one point, the soldiers decided that the civilians didn't have, a, have the, the right to do that, so they busted their friend out of the jail. Um, officers stepped in and, and returned them later. And th this is actually just a little bit, uh, the, the guy's an ex-soldier, but it's a good description. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, this is again more about the um, different uh, punishments that were, were occurring in Burlington. And there were actually, he's describing at the top here, he's describing the uh, execution of Peter Bailey. Um, and unfortunately, when they did the execution, and it was on where Battery Park is today, um, his, his wife and children were in town at the time. Um, but I think there was only four, maybe three or four um, uh, executions in Burlington during the war. Um, but again, you can also see here uh, running the gauntlet, and, let's see, let's see, and one, one was tarred and feathered and drummed out of camp. So it's, it's, as I say, they were quite diverse. Um, of course, you know, it's always the, the, the bad things that get you on your permanent record, not the good things. Um, one really quick story of a guy who was um, destined for ill luck was uh, Samuel Gottfried of the 11th Infantry. Um, he basically enlisted in 1812 and immediately ran afoul of, of uh, his commanders and uh, they were trying all sorts of these punishments and nothing was working on them. So at one point he just decides, heck with it, I want to get out of the, the military. So he basically goes to uh, Lyman King's Tavern and asks Lyman King how to get out of being in the military. And just, for, just as a note, the Lyman King place is just north of us right now. Um, that, that's where uh, Reroz is, where, where this hotel was. Um, and Lyman King comes up with the plan and he says, well, just, just steal something and then they'll arrest you and you'll just go to prison. And he goes, well, that's a pretty good idea. Um, so he looks around Lyman King's place and he steals, he steals a watch, money, and half a bottle of rum. Um, Lyman King is not impressed and uh, he prosecutes him for the theft. Needless to say, the guy ends up in Windsor Prison. And Partway through his uh, incarceration there, he has a falling out with one of the guards over how much wool he had uh, woven that day, how much fabric he had woven that day. The guard thought he was insolent, and he didn't think so. Um, so to prove his point, he just got a knife and a part of a leg from a stool and tried to make his point. Unfortunately, he killed the guard in the process, and he was then uh, hung in uh, Woodstock, Vermont, in 1818. So he didn't quite get out of where he wanted to be. 
Um, that it's, it's also kind of interesting that it's not all just the soldiers who, who are suspected of uh, uh, wrongdoing. Um, this is uh, Willis Falk talking about um, some problems amongst the civilians. There were some questions whether there were spies. Um, this guy alludes to some sort of signal fire that may have been, may or may not have been. Um, but of course these attacks, one of them's in the pamphlet, and the other one where uh, he talks about two people getting wounded is, uh, I've also confirmed that's true as well. So it's, I'm not sure about the fire, but the other, the other stories are accurate. Okay. Um, but it's not all just, you know, really serious. Um, Charles Fairbanks uh, definitely adds a little bit of humor to the whole situation. Um, he's basically complaining about uh, the way they do the church services. Um, another great complaint that the soldiers had also in the summertime was the only place really to go bathing was to go down, down the hill to the lake. And the officers in their wisdom decided that this was not healthy to go from being really hot to being really cool during the midday. So you couldn't bathe during the day. So at the hottest part of the day, in the hottest part of the year in Vermont, you had to just watch Lake Champlain go by. Um, okay. As I alluded to before, the, the kind of the most important part of the containment at Burlington was the, the large general hospital. Um, the, the kind of the two-story building in that first uh, image. It probably looked a lot like this. This is actually a survivor from a War of 1812 containment in Greenbush, and the description fairly accurate. Um, and you can see from this incredible list of things, uh, they were well-versed doctors. They, 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 they needed to know a lot about just about everything. Um, one of the ones, uh, one of the groups that I'm interested in is, are, are the accidents, because the accidents tell you a lot about what the soldiers were doing generally in their everyday lives. For example, one fellow got his hand caught in a hay press. Um, a number of guys um, were uh, pretty much squished between barrels, squished between the barrel and, and a boat, squished between a barrel and a house, squished between, you know, a, so moving the heavy materials was also a danger. Um, there was one guy who uh, broke his leg by stepping in a hole in the parade ground. Uh, a couple of other guys were just horsing around with their swords. Um, so you can just really see um, kind of what the experience of what, what was happening in Burlington. Um, next. A lot of the accidents aren't fatal, but they, that's, the, the point is, is that they tell you a lot about what the people are up to. Um, this one actually, however, is, was a fatal accident. And uh, Sergeant Ho uh, Hooper, um, also the 11th Infantry, was accidentally shot and uh, basically died on June 9th, uh, 1813. And the interesting part about his story was is that his, for some reason, they probated his estate in Burlington. And it pretty much consisted of a watch, a knapsack, and a couple of articles of clothing worth about $30. And that was it. Um, it was just an interesting place to find resources for, for this history. Yep. Um, but there was also uh, casualties that were treated at Burlington, specifically from the Battle of the Coal Mills, the Battle of Chateauguay, okay. And of course the Battle of Plattsburgh. Um, this was probably the most severe uh, episode of having to deal with, uh, you know, battle injuries. Um, I do believe it was about 79 uh, injured soldiers came by, and it was mentioned that 55 were severely injured. So it's an, probably another source for what John might be talking about in a few minutes. Um, okay. Uh, but for generally, um, most of the folks who who would perish at Burlington would be dying of disease, which is sort of typical for for the uh, Arby's of that time period. And of course, going to the hospital wasn't always a really great thing, um, if this is what you are facing. Um, I've actually found a couple of interesting uh, incidents of, of bleeding gone wrong in which you, basically you get an infection afterwards. And they, you know, it's like, not only are you bleeding, but we're gonna do it wrong. Um, but like, you know, basically you got lead, mercury, this is the very popular, um, uh, Fowler's mineral solution had arsenic in it. I mean, it's just, it's just a list of things that could go wrong. Um, okay. Just sort of to highlight, although disease, you know, all sorts of diseases, as, as the, the one list showed, you know, typhus, all of them. Um, the one disease really stands out, and that was, uh, it first made itself known in the winter of 1812, 1813, the first year that the, the army was here. Um, Basically, from this description, it does appear to be 
um, some sort of influenza. Uh, it explains the speed and the uh, symptoms as well as the, the findings. Go ahead. The findings that they actually did a couple of, let's see. Wait, I actually took out that quote. Um, they actually did a, a number of um, autopsies um, of soldiers, which also sort of seems to confirm that was an influenza epidemic. Um, and you can actually see the, the tremendous impact. At first I thought that this was maybe a little bit too high because it was only about maybe 1,500 soldiers in Burlington at the time. But as I do the research, this number is not too far off from the truth um, for the number of uh, fatalities during the epidemic. Okay. Let's see. Um, this is interesting because this goes back to the, the type of treatments that the, the hospital had to offer. This is uh, Josh, uh, Joshua Whitbridge. Um, he was actually in Burlington treating the soldiers, and this is specifically about uh, an individual in the 9th Infantry who uh, essentially refuses treatment initially, and basically the, uh, either may or may not have the wrong choice. Um, but it's a good quote. Now, um, at one point, the epidemic was so severe that they thought um, that uh, it was going to harm enlistments because the news of this epidemic would reach into the far south, all across New England. So people knew that in Burlington, people were essentially dying like flies. So a lot of people may have been uh, giving second thought to enlisting. And so the uh, hospital surgeon, um, the one who was actually in charge of Burlington at the time, this, this fellow here, um, as well as his commanding officer, all ma made a really good press campaign to try to say, no, it's not as bad as you think. And actually, at one point, they invite anybody who's concerned to come and see for themselves that the treatment's OK in Burlington. Um, one, actually, I found a, a number of people who actually took them up on this offer. Um, and one person that actually came up uh, to, to uh, it, this one's a little hazy. He either came up to, to try to help his son or to collect his effects. Um, but in so doing so, this old Revolutionary War soldier, uh, he comes up to Burlington and falls victim to the same epidemic. Um, he dies on his way home in uh, Hancock, Vermont, and is buried in Rochester. Um, so. Um, this is just kind of an, a, a side note. It's just really interesting that when times got bad in, in the cantonment, the local communities really did come to the aid of the soldiers. Um, you hear you have a um, uh, number of socks and mittens being offered uh, by the ladies of Shelburne. And then here's a, a lovely list of uh, food items offered by the town of Richmond. Um, okay. It's also interesting that some of the officers took some real serious interest in in their soldiers. And this is a, the great quote in here. I'll let you read it for yourself, but it is interesting, I just have to point out, that they're talking about uh, moving the, the uh, sick soldiers by the steamboat, and that would have been the, the Vermont one that you saw in the previous talk. Uh, but. Some of the soldiers were actually memorialized pretty well, um, especially early in the war when it was sort of a novelty to have uh, someone pass away. And this is a poem that made it into the uh, Burlington Sentinel upon the death of one of the officers of the 25th Infantry, which was really from the Connecticut area. Um, but, uh, and then, but most soldiers would pass with minor observation. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really get much in the record except for maybe dying at Burlington. This one's a bit of an exception. Um, it's James Ellsworth, also of the 25th Infantry. And uh, basically, his brother-in-law managed to see him just before he died in the barracks at Burlington. Yeah. Kind of fun, I just put this in here because this is the church that, the, uh, um, that James Ellsworth was married in in Connecticut. It's actually still there, although the front has been modified tremendously. Um, his widow did not remarry, and she's actually buried behind that church now. Um, this is just uh, showing you what happened to the cantonment after, um, uh, after its useful military career. Um, essentially, uh, President James Monroe came up in 1817, and he actually took a tour of uh, Plattsburgh, Virgins, and Burlington just to see the military um, uh, installations and what basically what could stay and what could go. And 
at that time, it, it, was, it appears that Burlington, it was decided Burlington could go, the cantonment could go from uh, U.S. holdings. And um, they, shortly after this, they, um, shortly after his visit, they made a map. And then in 1819, they decided that the Congress approved the sale of it. The first part uh, to be sold, oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Basically, also in 1817, people realized that the, the cantonment was going to be abandoned and they started taking whatever they wanted from the cantonment buildings when they could get away from, with it. Um, the last military event that actually happened in Burlington was this recruiting uh, effort in 1818. And then in uh, 1821, the cantonment was sold, well, not the, the buildings were sold to a private individual who started taking some of them apart. He leased some of them to the up and coming um, uh, glass factory in Burlington. But a lot of the houses in Burlington may actually have pieces of the cantonment in them. Uh, okay. Uh, this is, just shows you where the glass factory is. And here they are, um, just as shortly afterwards, in 1831, the same fellow bought the property of the cantonment. And in 1832, he basically sold it on to the glass works. And the glass works started splitting it up into individual areas to be sold. However, the, the group in 1840 decided to save a piece of it um, officially and give it to Burlington as Battery Park. Um, and now that um, basically Battery Park is all that's visibly um, there to remind us of the War of 1812 in Burlington, um, and even at that point, even at this point, the the remnant of the actual um, Churchill's Battery um, is now leveled, and, and it can't be visible. But we can look to archaeology to help us solve some more of the things, and that's John. 